So uh, you have been listening already for uh, about many Jewish languages. And some of those lecturers, of course, told you that they were, those are the most important, uh, the most ancient, and the most widespread, and so on and so forth, Jewish languages. And of course, my own private belief is that uh, no Jewish language has ever been that important as Jewish Greek because uh, for the very simple reason, uh, uh, of course, Ma uh, Maimonides and Saadia Gaon and all the rest are very important, but no book has ever been so important in all the history of Western humanity as Bible. And it is written in Judeo Greek. So uh, this is really the most uh, important and the most widespread piece of literature, if you can, well, wish to see it like that. So uh, we will ch we will uh, go through all those points, but uh, in slightly different order because uh, I would just uh, prefer to deal with the small issues first and then uh, pass to the larger ones. Okay, so speaking about language family, uh, Greek uh, is a uh, uh, Indo-European language. So here is Greece and uh, the Greek speaking areas in yellow. Uh, presumably the closest language to Greek is Armenian. Uh, they are not mutually intelligible. Uh, Greek wasn't the only language of its group. It had its relatives uh, on Balkans, uh, in Thrakia, probably also towards Illyria, which is nowadays uh, Albania, you see it colored here, and to, towards uh, Asia Minor, like Phrygia and all the minor languages here, uh, they have all disappeared, uh, being absorbed by Greek. Some of these la the languages uh, related to Greek in Asia Minor uh, were probably spoken uh, there uh, in the time where there was already some Jewish population in Asia Minor, uh, but uh, we do not have any specific data about that, so it's difficult to uh, be uh, sure. Um, well, um, and, and of course, I want, uh, I wouldn't uh, uh, remind you that Greek was one of the oldest documented languages on this planet, uh, because we have, uh, starting from the second uh, 2000 years, we see, we uh, have uh, uh, actually Iron Age, yes, uh, we have a culture on, uh, on the island of Crete, uh, we have linear A and linear B, and linear B for sure Greek. Uh, so uh, this documentation is really quite uh, quite reliable. Uh, the oldest uh, traces of contact between Jews and uh, uh, and Greek speakers are also around uh, first thousand of years before before Common Era. And uh, if you Google for some kind of, um, uh, let's see, uh, Greek, free, Greek region inscriptions, you will see nice uh, stele, burial stele with a Paleo Hebrew script on it. But this is not properly speaking Hebrew because uh, Hebrews were inhabitants of, uh, of the inland rather than of the shores. And of course, the trade between uh, Ionian shore and uh, the Middle East. Uh, mostly uh, dealt with uh, people living on the shores. Now, Judeo-Greek as a nomenclature, there is such thing which is, of course, uh, uh, you know, what exists in reality and what exists as a topic of, uh, of research. If you will ask, uh, or I believe that if you will ask a New Yorker Jew what language does he speak, he will probably answer that he speaks English rather than Jude uh, Jewish English, yeah, or Judeo-English. Well, the same holds for Greek. People will, say, will tell that they speak Elenica, that is Greek, and uh, hardly anybody actually is aware, notwithstanding the, uh, the energy put into it, that such thing as Judeo-Greek actually existed outside of scholarly community. Uh, I wrote this A of not only to underline the fact that there are different spellings in England and in, uh, in America, but also to, to make a point that eventually, eventually, on some stages of this contact, people thought about Jews not like a religious minority, but simply as an inhabitants of Judea, 
Uh, there is a lot of literature about it. Uh, now, when uh, Jewish languages as a linguistic subfield emerged, uh, most people dealing with this field were Americans and a specialist in y Yiddish and uh, uh, eventually in Ladino. Of course, they wanted all uh, the Jewish, all Jewish languages to look the same, so they took a pattern of Yiddish and transferred it into other languages. Uh, and that is how they, they created some terms like Yovanik or Tsarfatik or something, which was um, rather artificial uh, and had very, uh, very distant relation to, uh, to language reality. Uh, in Greek, in, well, if you speak to, a, to an average old, uh, if, if you spoke, because nowadays there is none, but if you spoke, if you would have spoken with uh, uh, to an uh, to a Judeo-Greek speaker, and asked him uh, what language he uh, his, he or she speaks, you will get the answer Elinika. Uh, of course, there existed a term for a secret language, which is Yavanitika or Yavanika or Yavanika, it depends on, uh, there are many variants because essentially there is a word for Greek, which is Yavan, uh, of the same root as Ionian uh, in Greek. Uh, so uh, from this, they built an adjective, uh, a neutral plural, which serves as a name of a language. This will normally be used uh, for, uh, uh, in order to, not to make yourself too clear to somebody whom you don't want uh, to understand you. So this is not a normal term for this language. And of course, its primary meaning is not the way in which uh, we, the Jews, communicate between ourselves, but it is rather the language of the Greeks. And of course, because the people normally didn't distinguish between two, one cannot say that the term Yvanic is in any sense synonymous to Judeo Greek. It is simply synonymous to Greek. Okay, sometimes uh, uh, you will uh, see in the literature the term Romaniotica, which originates from the word Roman, uh, Romaniotis, uh, that is the inhabitant of Romania. Uh, Romania uh, is uh, etymologically a, a state of Romans, that is Roman Empire. And because Byzantine Empire and the Greeks inhabiting it historically were the successors of this Roman Empire, and to be a Roman citizen was a prestigious thing. Uh, they called themselves inhabitants of Romania, that is Romaniotis, and from this they are uh, the term for the language derived. Uh, if you think about the other side of this, of, uh, uh, of this uh, duality, of uh, unity of these two, uh, two concepts, uh, then of course in rabbinic literature you will find the term Lars, which is uh, normally considered a term for any foreign language. Uh, in particular, you will find it uh, in discussions about, uh, oh, strange. Okay. Anyway, um, I probably deleted something accidentally. Um, yes. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, you will find it in uh, in such texts as Bavli Megillah in uh, in a piece of Babylonian Talmud, where people discuss the issue whether it is acceptable to read uh, parts of scripture and in particular, for instance, Megillah the Ster, uh, in Greek. And of course, the answer is that because Greek is such perfect language, one can uh, listen to Megillah the Ster in Greek, and will, one will fulfill his. Uh, religious obligation. So this term Laz Yavani is uh, used there. Now, an overview. Uh, main periods of the development of Judeo-Greek is Hellenistic and Roman, widely speaking ancient, then Byzantine, then Ottoman and Latin. Latin again in sense in which it is used for uh, in a or uh, in Greek history that is something done by uh, Westerners by somebody who came from Latin speaking Europe, that is uh, French, but mostly Italian. Uh, then there, uh, there is a short modern period uh, from the moment in which Greek, Greece became independent, that is liberated itself from the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire, uh, till the Second World War. 
and starting from the end of the uh, Second World War till, till nowadays. So uh, the uh, the map uh, shows how how Jews spread around Mediterranean, uh, and uh, you see that they they spread actually quite a lot. Uh, the point is, of course, that uh, in uh, uh, well, in contradistinction for, to all the other uh, stories of Jewish languages, it's not that Jews went somewhere, for instance, they went to, to Persia or they went to, I don't know, Spain, uh, but uh, that uh, Judeo-Greek actually emerged from the fact that uh, this territory was uh, conquered by Alexander the Great. So Greeks came to Jews. And they uh, conquered them, and uh, the Jews had no other option but to uh, accommodate themselves to this culture, which they uh, many of them do quite uh, uh, with great enthusiasm, because it brought to them a lots of lot of lots of good things uh, which came with Greek culture. That is good education and uh, uh, Greek education, and uh, theater, sports, uh, entertainment of all sorts, and the possibility to engage with uh, other inhabitants of the empire, which is trade and economic development. The result of that was a rather uh, profound uh, Hellenization, which meant that people learned uh, how to not only how to speak Greek, but also how to uh, how to read it, how to write it, and how to become uh, uh, cre creators of texts in this language. Uh, on your screen, you can see now the uh, uh, the part of the Vatican museums, which is called uh, Lapidario Ebraico, as you have seen. And major part of it, some, something is uh, in uh, Latin, as you see, something is in Latin and Greek. Uh, and of course, most part of it is in Greek. Uh, these are the burial uh, stones of Jews living in various parts of the empire. And of course, because it is Vatican Museum, it's mostly from Rome. But precisely the same, same things uh, you, uh, you can see all around the Mediterranean of all this large map which you have seen. Uh, from, the, uh, from Morocco, Spain, France, Italy, part of Balkan countries, and uh, all the, uh, all, the Tur all Turkish things of, uh, uh, you know, this one is this probably the most uh, famous of them, uh, the inscription. And going down to Egypt, of course, uh, almost and, uh, till Sudan, uh, and then Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, and so on. In all those places, people knew Greek, and Jews living in these places also did, uh, did enjoy this knowledge. They all were... Uh, one cannot... Uh, have a well uh, it's, it's very difficult to have an idea of how good the Jewish knowledge of Greek was uh, because suddenly there were people of different social levels there were uh, those who were more in contact with the surrounding population and those who were less oh, but certainly you see on uh, on multiple stones the uh, uh, the quite nice uh, oops sorry uh, the quite uh, the quite impressive uh, properly written Greek formula. Uh, here uh, uh, we have and then the kite. Normally this should be written with I A, and this is primitiva, which is a, a Latin name name of the of the woman. Metato engonu aftis. Uh, I'm reading now in modern uh, Greek st uh, style because generally the vowels have changed uh, more or less to uh, to be like those which are read nowadays. Uh, so meta to engonu of this uh, with her um, younger relative, maybe niece or maybe even a grandchild. Uh, 
Ephrononthos and Irini Gimesis Auton. And this is a, a traditional Jewish uh, formula for the, for the burial. Why? Because it includes the words Irini, Irene, uh, which means Shalom. Yeah? So they, they are lay, lying there in peace. And of course, you, you have here all the, uh, all the traditional Jewish uh, symbols. Uh, you have lulav, etrog, you have menorah, uh, and uh, uh, which, uh, as you can see, actually shows quite visibly that this is a Jewish identity expressed in, uh, in Greek language. Uh, this is from Katakop of Monteverde. And here is the thing which was, found, which was found probably even less than a year ago in a catacomb in Beit Shearim uh, in Israel, which is, uh, which as you may understand, uh, comes from some somewhat different uh, social environment. Uh, and uh, it shows uh, why I have chosen this, uh, this example and not uh, something nicer and more easily readable because it shows another aspect of Jewish culture in antiquity, uh, namely the fact that Judaism was an actively proselytizing religion. Jews were interested in more and more people becoming Jews. There is a lot of um, uh, reflection of, uh, uh, of this fact in uh, Roman literature. And uh, here uh, we can read Iacobos, yes, Prosilitos, that is uh, Jacob proselyte, yes, and then Exorcisi, uh, uh, he curses anybody who would bother his grave. This is very, uh, very uh, common uh, because people wanted their, their burials to be uh, untouched. Uh, and uh, as the uh, scholars say, this is a different hand. Uh, and uh, somebody has written that he was 60 years old when he passed away. Uh, so uh, you can see that actually even in, among the uh, non-Jews who were living in, uh, in Israel at that time, uh, uh, Palestine, whatever, uh, you can see uh, people who have decided to join or Judaism, which, which gives you uh, um, a rather complex picture of what was of Judeo-Greek on that time. That is certainly for somebody who, uh, who spoke uh, Hebrew or Aramaic, like, de depends uh, on the region and on uh, the precise chronology, uh, who was speaking a Semitic language as the first language. Uh, acquired Greek to some extent through education would have uh, L1 uh, Semitic and L2 uh, uh, Greek. Uh, those who had, uh, who were uh, proselytized and uh, uh, had their mother language Greek would have uh, the reverse uh, combination. But this is actually uh, even even better understand, uh, much even better, because uh, this is the point which uh, shows you that not only the common people, that is the uh, those trading and moving around the empire and uh, going into diaspora, returning back and so on, but also the authorities, uh, and no one less than Rabban Shimon Ben Gamliel, uh, uh, Omer, yeah? That is, uh, even the, the books, which is, which is uh, it means uh, holy books, Torah scrolls, yeah? uh, they cannot be written in any other language but Greek. That is, Greek was something which was completely acceptable uh, for, uh, for people studying Torah, because as we learn uh, from uh, whatever followed, there was a tradition of translating Torah uh, very closely, very closely. What do I mean by translating Torah uh, very closely? Uh, it means that uh, you uh, take a text and you aim in transmitting its contact very, 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 very uh, precisely. That is each, uh, because the, the Torah is sacred, so each, each and every word should be translated. Uh, and it doesn't matter that uh, in, Greek, in Greek it makes no sense. Uh, but anyway, out of respect for the text, we should translate it all. Uh, 
naturally, naturally, when Christianity emerged as a, initially as an ideological trend within Judaism, uh, then uh, the people who were uh, became Christians uh, also spoke Jewish Greek. And here you have the map of the uh, travels of uh, uh, Paul, who was Saul before that. Uh, and uh, as far as uh, we know from the New Testament, the Acts of Apostles and all, so on and so, so forth, uh, he was visiting various uh, Jewish synagogues and preaching here, uh, there, and he, of course, in all those synagogues, people spoke Greek. Uh, and uh, he was well understood. Uh, this was written down and became the sacred scripture of the new religion. Mm. And uh, here is one, probably the most known example, which is uh, Codex Sinaiticus, uh, the oldest uh, manuscript of Old Testament translated into Greek and of New Testament, which grew out of it. Well, you see here the uh, rather nice uh, mayuscule script. Uh, this is fourth century, and uh, it is all online. So whoever wants, wants to read it, uh, you're very welcome. Uh, the fact that uh, Old Testament was translated into Greek is of primary importance uh, because it opened uh, Judaism to the to all the peoples of or people of of Mediterranean, uh, it became a uh, accessible religion, and uh, Jewish ideas started to spread in the world through the media of Greek, which was already there, because uh, if by chance uh, they would have. Uh, no, the, the empire of uh, Alexander wouldn't have uh, existed and the Roman Empire wouldn't have existed. It is doubtful that a small people somewhere in the corner of Mediterranean would have been able to project itself so powerfully uh, in the history of humanity. So the Greek language was this medium through which it worked. Uh, uh, again, to the same map, uh, have a look on it. Uh, there was a great Jewish population in Egypt. In fact, if you look on uh, some taxation documents in, uh, in Egypt, you will find people having nice Jewish names registered as Hellenists. That is, they were, they identify themselves as Greek and authorities identified them, them, them as Greek and nobody had any problem with that. But generally Greek culture, uh, but, at that time and until nowadays is extremely inclusive. That is, if you want to, uh, to learn things Greek, you will become a Greek. Well, this is something which was told by, uh, you know, by Aristoteles and generally by, by Socrates, by many other authorities of uh, uh, Greek rhetorics and philosophy, that whoever wants to learn Greek and participate in our culture will become Greek, in a sense. Uh, very, uh, very large uh, region in which Jews uh, lived was Italy. Uh, Greek language was in general quite popular among, uh, uh, among Roman aristocracy. Uh, every noble Roman child will study Greek in his childhood. Uh, so the, 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 the point that they were Greek speakers enabled Jews um, to influence the decisions which were made in the capital and uh, spread themselves even further to the north. Uh, when the empire divided, uh, if, oops, sorry. Uh, you will see here the animated development of the uh, Byzantine Empire. Of course, first it, it became separated into uh, uh, West and East, and then uh, followed uh, various uh, events, uh, the most important of which is, of course, the arrival of Arabs who co completely se separated all these parts of Mediterranean from, they, they kind of ex excluded this from Greek speaking. Uh, this was the initial uh, the initial situation, and then uh, all the Egypt and all the shore, except of the short period uh, pointed here as uh, 550, that is the 
in the reign of Justinian, uh, when they managed to reconquer this shore, uh, actually Arabs have pushed out uh, um, Greek and Judeo-Greek from uh, the southern shores of Mediterranean. But nothing in this world is absolute. And of course, it doesn't mean, mean that uh, Judeo-Greek was completely forgotten here. No, on the contrary, we have in the Geniza evidence uh, that Jews were studying Greek on basic level, that is like alpha, vita, gamma, alphabet, yeah, uh, learning how to write uh, Greek letters. Uh, and uh, uh, this would, would make sense because the, the trade uh, from Alexandria uh, going uh, along the shore uh, and uh, in the other direction to Kiranaika uh, would have been always profitable and there would be no sense to forget the language which is so useful. Uh, then uh, the, uh, the other sad part of this story was of course the arrival of uh, Seljuks and uh, uh, the uh, uh, the, uh, the last piece of the Byzantine story, that is the co conquering of Constantinople uh, and, uh, uh, and the fall of the empire. Uh, rather destructive for the empire were the Crusades, which came from Europe to, uh, to the region of Constantinople, has devastated it quite a lot. Uh, for some time, uh, empire actually was divided into some small states, which you have seen uh, previously, that is uh, Trapezunt uh, as independent state, uh, Theodoro as independent state. Uh, but eventually they all succumbed to, uh, to Ottoman Turks. Uh, and this sad event happened in 1453. Uh, To uh, how do we know and what can we know about uh, this period? Uh, many people write about it as about dark ages of Judeo-Greek history. In fact, Cairo Geniza, that is the, uh, the collection of uh, old manuscripts collected uh, in Cairo synagogue, uh, or actually not a collection, it's just a garbage bin. Uh, it looked like that. That is uh, the, the famous picture that's our old library in Cambridge uh, with uh, uh, Solomon Schechter sitting in, uh, uh, engaged in reading the manuscripts. Now the manus manuscripts are all restored and they look like this. They are placed between the sheets of melamine. Uh, they are uh, bound uh, around. And unless you have a very, very serious reason, it won't get out of this package. Uh, what do we have in Cairo Geniza? We have private letters, which are not written in Judeo-Greek, but they include Judeo-Greek, in particular in the points where people didn't know enough Hebrew and had to, uh, to write in, uh, in Greek. There are instructions of Seder, where the prayers are in uh, Hebrew, of course, but the instructions may be in Greek. There are biblical and Mishnai glossaries explaining to people the, pa the passages from sacred script. Uh, and uh, uh, biblical commentaries, mostly in Hebrew, with, but with uh, uh, insertions in Greek, or Talmud, more or less similar to whatever we have now, with glosses of various types. And there is one, and this is in singular, <laughs> biblical translation. Uh, why do we have so little? And you may be surprised because just a second ago I was talking about how great Judeo-Greek uh, was and how it was widespread and how popular and how useful. Uh, unfortunately, with, uh, from the moment in which Arabic came uh, and Arabic became a state language on the southern part of the Mediterranean, it became much easier for people because they are, in a sense, because they, uh, whatever you may think about uh, difference between Hebrew and Arabic, they are much closer as languages. So it is easier to, to learn uh, Hebrew script and Torah and to speak Arabic in your everyday life than to learn two things which are so distinct as Hebrew and Greek. Uh, then, uh, of course, there was also some kind of uh, theological uh, point here, because uh, 
Christianity, which was a dominant religion in Byzantine Empire, they, uh, they didn't take Jews very well. They tried to uh, kind of modify the, uh, the behavior of the communities to make them closer to Greeks, that is, uh, encourage them reading sac sacred scripture in Greek. But because rabbinic authorities wanted to have a power of their own, uh, it resulted in very strong rambinization and the fact that the further you go from uh, the 7th, 8th century, the more are the chances that people who were educated got their educated in Hebrew uh, and not in Greek. Uh, what I mean in Hebrew is just that whatever their mother language was, for instance, Arabic, uh, they studied Hebrew as a medium of write, written, as a written language, as a medium of communication. That's why they actually wrote their uh, letters in, in Hebrew. And uh, slowly, slowly, uh, this switch uh, uh, became complete. Uh, what can you see here? This is a page of Talmud. And uh, this is, uh, well, for uh, our Geniza, in our, in our Geniza words, this is quite normal manuscript. It's not the worst and not the best. And if you have very good eyes, you can see that here on the margin, and eventually somewhere above the line, they are, there are glosses. And if you, you have very good eyes, you will see that those are actually in Greek script. Uh, this is a biblical commentary which is even more right because it has Greek in main text written in, in Hebrew script, uh, vocalized because it's normally needed. Otherwise you cannot understand uh, Greek written in Hebrew. Uh, and you also have uh, Greek glosses between the lines. And this is the most famous uh, text about which uh, uh, I was talking. This is the translation of Ecclesiastes, uh, of uh, Kohelet, uh, which, uh, which is really a very, very small passage, uh, a small piece of, uh, piece of writing. Uh, and as most Judeo-Greek texts, uh, it is made for your for own private usage. Uh, it is rather rare because it has a very, very clear hand. It's really professionally written and is fully vocalized, which means that you can uh, read it with, uh, with ease. Uh, and uh, well, whoever wants to try, who may do it, yeah. Uh, uh, whatever. Uh, so uh, this and the other side of it uh, are the only coherent texts which we have in Cairo Geniza, unfortunately. Uh, again, either because people, people didn't need them any longer as they switched to Arabic, some of them actually they wiped, that is they took the parchment, they uh, washed it off and uh, wrote uh, something on the top of it. And the others, they were uh, uh, simply um, discarded. Apart from Geniza, we actually do have uh, some proper nice manuscripts. Uh, these nice manuscripts, uh, they also uh, are not a Judeo-Greek texts as such, but they are Judeo-Greek parts of larger uh, works like uh, prayer books. This particular thing which you are seeing now is a prayer book. Uh, 14th century, uh, with, which was sold in 16th century, and uh, you can, uh, this is the book of Job. Uh, normally you see uh, uh, some kind, some part of Hebrew verse, and after that, yeah, Elohim Elyonah, yeah, Ben Amitai, Vechule, Kum Lech, book of Jonah. And the translation of the same thing into Greek, and so on, uh, which, which was uh, an appendix, a part of the prayer book. Mm, the things which uh, appear in this form in prayer books are, of course, those which were frequently read during the liturgy, 
uh, in Greek, because as we have already seen, or halachically uh, it was allowed and uh, people used this opportunity to read something nice in their own language. Oh, this particular part uh, is Cretan and probably has some uh, influences which uh, are from European, Italian and, uh, and other places. Now, uh, between uh, these last centuries in which uh, Byzantium existed and from which we have uh, these documentation which we have discussed already, uh, uh, between this and the following period, there lies a large gap. I was looking for a map which would show the, uh, the uh, spread of Ottoman Empire but unfortunately, I found only things which, are, which were very approximate and which shows that Ottoman Empire has eaten all of Greece and uh, nothing remained, which I didn't want to, uh, to show because it's historically wrong. This map also has its problems, but is generally quite much, uh, much more historical. Uh, uh, in uh, common narratives of Jewish history, one normally uh, hears that uh, oh, uh, the uh, uh, the Jews from Spain and Portugal and South South Italy they came to Ottoman Empire, which was welcoming, nice, and generally this picture is quite rosy. Well, this picture wasn't rosy, in fact, and uh, certainly not for uh, for Judeo Greek speakers, uh, because when Constantinople was uh, captured by Turks, it was a uh, it, it was uh, the picture which they saw was that of absolute devastation, and they were writing laments about the fall of Constantinople, just as they wrote about the fall of Jerusalem, the ones which I read for the Shabayev. And uh, the Turks, uh, the conquerors, they treated local populations just uh, not really like humans. That is, if uh, because the, the, uh, this picture of, uh, of uh, devastation was so complete, they decided that they should move some Jews to the uh, newly conquered territories in order to develop uh, the economy there. Uh, which means that uh, several uh, tens of uh, communities were just lifted and compulsorily transferred into uh, Constantinople. And the process of transfer was not one off act. It actually, uh, it, uh, it lasted for years and uh, uh, people were transferred there using completely, each time the criteria which the administration needed, that, that is for instance, if they needed, uh, needed professionals in some specific craft, they were going through the communities, uh, picking up all those people who, whom they needed and sending them to Asia Minor. Uh, or they just decimated them. They saw that we do not need that many people. We will just take every tenth. As you may imagine, this was a, a huge, uh, hugely uh, problematic. Uh, this this policy was was considered as cruel and unjust, uh, and people suffered from it a lot. Uh, when in the, uh, after 1492, the Spanish immigrants came. Spanish Jewish immigrants came to the territory of Ottoman Empire, you may understand that in many places they found essentially uh, uh, communities were destructed, uh, were destroyed and uh, quite uh, in, in, uh, or in problematic state. Because if we think about it halachically, normally the people who come to some place should, uh, should accept uh, the custom, the minhag uh, of, um, of the locals which in this case would be Minhag Romania, that is Minhag of Romaniokim and a uh, Greek one. Uh, but uh, in many places of Greece, the opposite thing happened. Uh, in particular, uh, Thessaloniki, which was the, uh, like probably the most famous thing, uh, thing which you know about uh, Greek Judaism. Uh, when the great amount of new arrivals comes to the place which is already impoverished, uh, which is already devastated. And uh, 
you also should take into consideration that the people who have enough money for traveling or have enough courage, they are normally uh, advanced part of the population because they uh, the less fortunate or less bold part of uh, Jewish uh, or Spanish population, they have just converted and with this, uh, their Jewish story has ended. So, uh, and uh, these newcomers, they have established themselves in the northern parts of Greece. They are uh, around uh, the Thermaikos Kolpos uh, here, uh, then uh, on uh, some islands uh, and uh, quite significantly in the uh, around Peloponnese. And they also came to Crete. Uh, only in some places have men, the locals have managed to actually uh, uh, absorb the newcomers. Uh, when we think about how this story ended, we ended, it, uh, it ended differently in different places. And of course, each, each, each community had its own story to tell. The, uh, for instance, in Crete, which, as you can see from this map, was actually uh, of the less uh, Turkified and less, uh, less Ottoman, uh, 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 less captured, uh, the, uh, fewer, fewer, had the fewer years of Ottoman occupation, because all the rest of, of, uh, of this period they spent under Venetian rule. They all somehow managed to coexist. Venetian rule had its own, its own negative sides because uh, while in general, in general, in Byzantine times, people were free to choose their, like, their, the, the ways they accommodate themselves in urban space or in villages. Uh, Venetians were the ones which brought the first ghettos here. And uh, uh, the uh, exercised some, some amount of pressure on local Jewish population. Uh, Jews from Ionian islands were uh, very, some of the islands were actually more Judeo-Italian speaking rather than Judeo-Greek speaking. Um, when uh, the Spaniards arrived, the, uh, the community administration was, in Constantinople, it was kept separate, then uh, uh, there was, of course, some necessity of creating something uh, joint as uh, uh, or unite your, uh, oneself ar around something which uh, different Jewish communities had in common. And this is, of course, Torah. So here you see the uh, one of the uh, first polyglot Bibles, which is called Constantinople Pentateuch. Uh, printed as uh, one can read here in uh, uh, in this on this page by Gershon Soncino, a famous uh, printer from the Italian family of Soncino, who came to Constantin uh, the family came to Constantinople. Uh, uh, so, sorry, I said about Gershon. Anyway, they were for, uh, from uh, people coming from this family, and later on they con they continue this uh, uh, their printing activity even in Alexandria. Uh, they printed Constantinople Pentateuch. Uh, which had translations into Judeo Greek and Judeo uh, Spanish, and of course the original and Targum, uh, as, as as one would expect. This is the longest text which exists in uh, in Judeo Greek. You may ask us again that why don't we have anything which we have in Spanish in Judeo Spanish? That is, why don't we have? Uh, or uh, independent works written in or uh, in Judeo Greek. Well, the answer probably is that most people who were uh, Greek uh, speakers and were Jewish uh, probably knew enough Greek to be able to write in Greek. And since they will get that more audience while writing in Greek, they normally would write in Greek and we will not be able to distinguish between a manuscript written by a Jew and a manuscript written by a non-Jew. We know for certain that uh, practical works, by practical I mean medical mostly, in pharmacology, uh, works were translated from Greek uh, into Hebrew by Jews for the benefit of other Jews. We also know that uh, the um, Karai Jews, that is, uh, 
well, it, they were mentioned, maybe you remember, uh, some kind of, uh, well, uh, of, of non-rabbinic Judah, uh, uh, non-rabbinic uh, Jewish groups, which came from uh, uh, <coughs> from the east and uh, via Jerusalem northwards, uh, they uh, found Greek also very useful because uh, they discovered uh, that they can use their knowledge of Arabic and Hebrew to make all the uh, to, to enrich local population. And by doing so, they became so much attached to Greek language that they, they continued to speak it until uh, recently, until this community actually uh, dwindled also. This is how uh, uh, more recent uh, Judeo-Greek manuscripts look. Uh, this is a... Um, uh, 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 this is uh, organized uh, to, uh, in according with, para, with Parashot Shavua. So you have here uh, Parashat Aira. You can see that it is written in Solitreo, which, uh, uh, well, you, there are a couple of things in standard, uh, something which is like more square script. Uh, but generally speaking, they adopted Solitreo and uh, uh, Slightly nicer is the, uh, the Hebrew part, um, slightly more cursive the Greek one. Oh, this is a huge glossary, very, very thick. Uh, I've done most of it and uh, probably it will be ready because I'm going to write about uh, the piece uh, for, uh, uh, for some theoretical points. Uh, yeah. Of course, uh, because Jews were, re were living all around, they are Mediterranean, they were speaking different dialects. We do not have uh, uh, data about, or we have very, very, very oblique data about the uh, Jewish Greek, which was, which existed in Italy, for instance. So mostly we have uh, the data uh, from, uh, let us say, Ottoman and Ottoman Latin period and later. Uh, from the places which were, uh, which are located in Greece, uh, namely uh, from Yanina, yeah, which is here, from uh, Crete, which is here, uh, and unfortunately, unfortunately from nowhere else. Why so? Because when the Greek re revolution and the Greek, uh, well, war of liberation happened, they have managed to conquer the whole, uh, the whole Peloponnese, and uh, everyone who was uh, who was living here actually was killed. This is unfortunate, but that's what happened. The Jews who lived in uh, Negroponte, which is now called Halkida, uh, were of course, uh, in a sense, suburban to Athens, and uh, many of them immigrated to Europe. With the result that we have uh, absolutely now nothing today. Uh, Let's hear a, a piece of. Και τι είχανε χώρια και σου λέγανε θες να κάνουν τα πειράματα. Ως σου λέγανε ότι δεν θα ανέχεις φόβο να σε κάψουμε, δεν θα ανέχεις τίποτα. Δηλαδή, εβα... το πρωί το ήταν αυτό το τσάι, ο πικάφες. Και αυτό το φαΐ που μας περιβάζει. Το φαΐ ήταν το μεσημέρι. Το μεσημέρι. Ναι. Και το βράδυ. Το βράδυ μας δίνανε 30 γραμμάρια ψωμάκι με ένα κομμάτι μαργαρίνα από το ευρέι. Um, I do apologize for the content, but unfortunately there is nothing else uh, left from Cretan, uh, from real Cretan samples. Uh, those are, this is a recording made by Shoafa Foundation, which were, rel were recently uh, became public, and you can listen to it online. Uh, you would, those of you who know Greek will understand that actually the lady speaks proper normal Greek of uh, which one would expect from a lady on her age and it does not have a really uh, prominent uh, Cretan features because uh, the, the features described as Cretan, uh, the, uh, partially they are Cretan of villages, the others can be seen in earlier stages of Cretan literature, uh, but still because she has spent most of her life outside Crete and that's how she survived, um, this is uh, not really uh, a very remarkable point, but still I would like to show you something. 
Και μετά αρχίζαν τη μουσική. Είχαν μουσική. She tells the story, the story of her. Όταν βγαίναμε κουμάντα. Εγώ ήμουν στο κουμάντο των αποχωρητήριων, να διάζω τα βαρέλια. Μας βάνανε κάτι λουριά. Ξέρεις τα λουριά που βάνε και από πίσω ήταν τα αυτά του κάρου. Κάρα τα λέγανε, δεν ξέρω πώς. Και από πάνω ήταν τα βουτία. Παδιάζαμε το καμπίνε. Πηγαίναμε, αδειάζαμε τις βόθρους και ξανά yeah, γυρίζαμε. Και είμαστε από το και πάλι yeah. μέχρι κάτω μες την ακαταρσία. Αυτή ήταν η ζωή μας. Αλλά με αυτό yeah, με yeah, την yeah, μισοκή yeah. βγαίναμε. Uh, okay. Uh, when she was saying, Adiaza uh, Metswotros, yes, uh, that is, we were emptying the, uh, um, well, uh, she is talking about the toilets in the concentration camps. Uh, the point which you can hear here, uh, listen to here, is this t, which uh, she pronounces, uh, which is a normal Greek as tus, is the article. Yeah. Uh, uh, syntactically, uh, a speech is absolutely standard, and you will not find anything of particular interest here. Uh, have a look on the το Πάσχα που σου λέω ύστερα από 15-20 μέρε ήταν το Πάσχα και είχαμε την πόλη. Uh, 15-20 days after there was. Uh, and she, she calls it Πάσχα, you can hear it. So she doesn't actually use the word Pesach. She just used the normal word for Christian, uh, Christian feast. Πόρτα ανοιχτή. Είπε ο άντρα μου, θα καθίσω με την πρώτη αγκαδά να την πούμε με του. Uh, and my husband uh, uh, told, we will sit and, and uh, tell the first Agada, the Proti Agada. Yeah? Have you had it? Συγγενείς με τους φίλους που έχουμε καλυσμένους εργοτεί, θα φάμε και θα φύγουμε. Θα ανταμώσουμε εμείς οι τέσσερις φίλοι που αγαπάμε τις τέσσερις κοπέλες. Όποια πόρτα είναι ανοιχτή πρώτη, θα μπούμε. You, you also hear that she makes, uh, like, she shortens the vowels eventually. Uh, but not to such extent as you would expect from, um, say, a speaker of, uh, of a northern dialect. Yeah. Here, uh, this is Esther Cohen, which I knew personally. She's the, the old passed away now. Uh, she's telling about her mother. Uh, addressing her as a child uh, in the moment in which they uh, they were taken to the camps uh, and you hear here actually quite clearly the la the, la the loss of vowel in the end yeah <laughs> You can hear semasta mekra, yeah, this, which is again the uh, complete uh, deletion of all vowels. Okay, so distinctive features in Judeo Greek, they are quite standard. They are literature and private observance. That is, you will have uh, amidash, uh, you know, kidush and all these things which of course can be actually translated into Greek because as you have heard in the previous example, this will be just, uh, uh, well, uh, replaced by a corresponding Greek vocabulary. Retail objects such as lulava and the drog are, are more difficult to replace. So this is a more stable part of vocabulary. Alaha and abstract religions concepts, uh, they are popular such as zehut and uh, uh, Zaka, uh, charity, and so on and so forth. Community and synagogue organization. You will find this very actively used. That is, for instance, and it's quite interesting that they have parnas, which is uh, in which us is perceived to be a Greek ending of nominative singular. So you will have the declension like parnas, parna, and so on. And you will have hupa as events of like a life cycle, uh, uh, kriya, kura, and so on. Uh, of course, there are more chances that it will be used by male than by female. Uh, for secret language, you will have uh, something which is uh, refers to trade terms, for instance, good or bad merchandise, religious allegiance, such as a Muslim or a Christian, how to tell that somebody is foreign, and uh, with somebody is a member of some group which you don't like. So uh, you have a word, ze, 
like for these people who you dislike. As you have already understood, we have a variety of writing systems, probably starting with Palo Hebrew, it's actual Hebrew, then switching to uh, Aramaic, which is normally called Hebrew, then to Greek, or then to a combination of Hebrew and Greek, and ultimately to Greek. Here you see, for example, courtesy of one of my friends, it's his mother's uh, Pesach book, which has in her handwriting rather bad Hebrew here, and also rather unstable hand, of course, uh, uh, for uh, the instructions in Greek, not too much orthographic. Uh, and uh, well, the, probably the last thing which I'd uh, like to notice is that uh, there is a great variety of uh, forms, both historically and uh, synchronically nowadays, which of course de depend on your social status, which is linked to your possibility to achieve good education. Females were normally speaking the closest to the, uh, or to the Christian population. And uh, the origin and relative uh, uh, relative authority uh, of this or, or, or another uh, community. Contemporary status is uh, something which you uh, put, uh, um, which is rather problematic because, of course, after the Second World War. Uh, because the survivors were so few, they had to intermarry each other, and in fact, there's, there is no, no longer any Romaniot as such, but there is a kind of mixed Judeo-Greek, which is uh, standard Greek, with uh, Hebrew and Aramaic vocabulary borrowed from uh, standard Israeli Hebrew and from English. On this for picture, you see somebody who says, proud Romaniot, my heart is, this lady is not Romaniot. This is Marcia Hadad Economopoulos. Uh, she manages the community of, of uh, uh, Judeo-Greek speakers in New York. And uh, this is uh, Moises Eliasaf, he passed away a couple of weeks ago. He was the first Jewish mayor in, uh, in Greece, which is quite sad, yeah. Uh, well, and just as a last example for, um, post-vernacular activity, you see that post-vernacular activity related to Jewish Greek exists also in Israel, not also, uh, not only in New York uh, as represented by Marsha, but also uh, as a part of so-called Radio Yasu, which is a community of about 5,000 uh, listeners uh, It exists about 20 years. Uh, which are like just like uh, Marsha is organizing travel, traveling to Yanina and uh, all kinds of uh, meetings uh, when people, uh, yeah, Kabbalah Shabbat with Haverim in Meshagada with the lady uh, uh, which represents the Yanyot community. In the same way, people are traveling from Israel, and uh, most of them are, of course, uh, uh, again, they, they will be Judeo Spaniards for whom Greek is uh, a kind of symbolic allegiance and not a real language. Uh, most of them will not speak it. Uh, but this exists, and uh, this is how we... Uh, oops. Yeah, I wanted to finish with the music, but the music is obviously unavailable for some reason which I cannot understand. But I have finished. <laughs>